Hey everybody and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Tami. Tami is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Welcome to our podcast where we bring you the most inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and experts in the software development industry. Each week we interview successful leaders who share their unique journeys and valuable insights. Today we have an incredible guest joining us. Philip Piper, who is co-founder of Sram. Hello, Philip. How are you doing? How is your morning? I believe your site. Alexander, very good. No, it's uh, finally for a change. We have rain, and these oh. days, it uh, water from the sky is not so not so much these days. So I'm pretty happy about rain. Normally, I wouldn't be so. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, I can share those feelings with you as well because today we have also. Uh, I don't know. It's like the window of rain from the sky, the yeah. window from water. Yes. Uh, okay. So we are here to talk about your company. So I will give just one sentence details about your company, Swarm. So Swarm provides compliant, um, permission, decentralized financial infrastructure. We will dive, uh, into those topic, uh, later on, but firstly, I want to explore more you on a personal level, just to get to know you better. Mm -hmm. Sure. Happy to so see. my first question will be, imagine you have the power to solve only one major problem in the world through your entrepreneurial endeavors. What problem would you choose to solve and how would you go about solving it? I think, okay, so that's a very bold question. I. I would say the, the, it's almost like a cheesy answer to that question. Um, I think we're doing it. I think, um, you know, we've chosen with, with what we're currently doing, we've chosen a category that I think is one of the most important categories to get right going forward. I mean, there's other categories too, um, but I think um, it's hard to overstate if, if we are successful in contributing to overhaul the financial ecosystem. And I'm not talking about like Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrencies i'm talking about the the real financial ecosystem to make it more efficient to make it more inclusive to make it you know easier to to navigate for individuals i think that's you know that's the life lifeliness of of humanity in some ways right and mm -hmm. if you if you then think what you can solve with that too uh, in terms of like um you know financialization for you know sustainability for you know carbon emissions if you then pair it up with basically uh, imp improving the ability for entrepreneurs to gain access to capital markets or creating new wealth creation for individuals. That's, that's something that I, I'm, I'm, I've grown very passionate about, but also that I think that um, is part of the problem going forward that we need to get, get right and get solved. Because the way that sort of the economic incentives worldwide have tilted towards the rich um, I think it's, it, it needs to be rethought and infrastructure is mm -hmm. part of that. Okay. So we definitely, um, come back to those topic regarding what actually you are doing at Swarm and, um, but touch on the topic about your company and about your experience. If you could swap roles with any other, uh, founder or entrepreneur, or let's say maybe a member of your team in your company. Who would it be and why? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think like you say last, I think, I think one of the, the more interesting pieces would be to actually swap with someone who's working with me to see the outside perspectives mm -hmm. of how, how that's really perceived. I'm not going to say that that's my answer because I, I feel like over the years I've grown a, 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 a like, you know, pretty self-conscious about what I am and, and having sort of more openness to actually be open to that. But, you know, I think. Like entrepreneurs that I admire in the way that they've built their businesses, um, you know, I would include, you know, someone like Jack Dorsey in that, for example, the uh, founder of Twitter and the founder of um, of, of um, Square and and other ventures. Um, I've always found him to be a what I sort of call the pr a principles based entrepreneur. So he he over the years has grown to be very engaged in social impact. He's very grown to actually sort of look beyond the horizon of actually the immediate use case that he's trying to solve for has done some incredible engagements and actually in the category, um, that I'm working in. But, you know, if, if, if I would actually swap with him, I think 
I think what I would want to learn within a day, and it's hard to say what you really learn, is mm -hmm. just how he balances off those different perspectives and how he, he surrounds himself with people that actually sort of buy into that same kind of perspective. And, um, you know, that's not, not about like the ADD of running two or three different projects, but it's more about like the, the consideration that goes into um, how he structures his day, what, uh, what, how he builds the products, um, and and basically also understand a little better the um, you know the perspectives that where that's coming from um, is it coming from just like building successful startups or is it actually sort of another mm -hmm. dimension that suddenly plays a much bigger role and almost the same thing would apply if I would actually include Sam Altman from OpenAI which has a much much more critical role going forward because he's obviously sort of working on technology that has a chance to change our society. So in that case, you know, just same, same story, almost understanding better. What are the things that he's thinking about? What are the early innings of technology that are un, un, unfolding there? And maybe even just is the ethical and safety considerations really part of his daily doing? Right. So. I believe that those uh, possibilities and opportunities when you can change the role just for only one day, it helps you uh, to understand uh, what your colleagues are doing and for example, what did the experience, for example, of your part of work make on theirs? So it's like those understanding of the flaw. And I believe it's it's needed to be in, impacted, not impacted, but um, included to to the company's cultures. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay, so um, my next question, uh, if you could go back in time, and give one piece of advice to your younger entrepreneurial self. What would it be and why? Uh, when, I, when I started to be an entrepreneur, that was, uh, I was way younger than today. And I, I think uh, it was it was sort of at the beginning of, of my career. I had just come from financial markets, you know, had gone into the entrepreneurial space. Um, and I, I think at the beginning, I was way more concerned around like, how, like, would I be successful? Uh, how would I be successful? Like, uh, be, how would I be perceived by the outside to be successful too, right? And all those dimensions um, have too much to do with myself in that context, right? Mm -hmm. um, today, my priorities have completely shifted. And that's basically because I know a lot more about myself, but also I know a lot more about, I would say, the, the craft of entrepreneurial spirit, right? So it's, it's, how do I become more resilient? How do I mm -hmm. manage different priorities? How do I have the confidence to get through something, although I don't have all the answers, right? And that you can only gain with more experience. But if I if I would go back, basically, I would my advice, and I, I'm giving this advice to anyone who's you know a sort of younger entrepreneur that asks me, is basically sort of be relaxed. It will be okay. But then again, you know, be persistent and stubborn and work through it, right? Mm -hmm. Because there is no magic wand of successful entrepreneurs. It, it is really tough work and it often has nothing to do with what you can control. It often has to do with outside factors that you have no control over. And what does success mean to you? That over time has shifted too, for sure, mm -hmm. right? I think, um, of course, monetary success means a lot in this um, context because without the monetary success, you're always bogged down by, um, you know, by the by the burden of actually having to sustain your life, right? But once that's sort of achieved, you know, I think um, to me it's much more important today to work on things that have an impact. And you know, I'm not talking about like a global impact necessarily, but have an impact that it's not just wasted on some, you know, side topic that doesn't matter really. And I, I think I've made choices along the way where you know, topics that I were was working on previously were no longer interesting to me as much. And I was consciously looking into areas where like my my talents, number one, would be needed, but more importantly, that the these talents would then actually have a, have an impact with the things that I do. That that purpose uh, is much more much more important because then everything else follows. You know, my motivation follows, my success probably follows the mm -hmm. the team you know, working with me on this the same way. So I think it's all about like making conscious choices in that sense to spend time in this, in this, uh, I mean, time is the scarce resource that we have, 
but spend time with the stuff that really matters. And, you know, a friend of mine actually gave me a t-shirt once says, you know, um, build, build things that matter. And, you know, that encapsulates, you know, it, you know, if, if you work on the, you know, hundreds version of a, of a, you know, advertising targeting solution, mm -hmm. it's not, it's not going to change the world in any sense. You've mentioned um, that some things, uh, they have changed during along your entrepreneurial path. Uh, what was the, let's say, pivotal challenge in your journey that shaped your approach to building large-scale data products? Sure. Um, so just a background. So I, I started my, my whole technology. Well, I started my career in Germany, actually working for international corporations, you know, um, partially in the financial industry with Deutsche Bank and with Allianz Group. But then, you know, just consciously, because I was always like a, an, a, an engineer by heart, I actually moved into technology, built a company that pretty soon we actually brought to Silicon Valley. And, um, that to me was a, a huge change, right? Num number one, I think it was basically um, going into the, like this was in 2006, so like quite a time ago. Um, but on one hand, going into this ivory tower of technology, this global village of technology that at the time was the de facto standard where technology was built. I mean, the, the, the technology and software specifically that meant something, the internet businesses that meant something. Um, and that did two things. Well, on one hand, it actually made me, you know, really, really appreciate what's happening locally there, which means say, it's, it's, it's like this network, this of, of people that you get exposed to the openness that is incredible. Like you, you can come there with just a good story and an intellectual mind and you, you will be heard. There's no, there's no barriers of you actually succeeding there. That's it's, it's almost like the, the American dream on steroids at the time, at least. But the second thing also happened was. Um, we, we have a saying in Germany where we say like, like, um, you know, everyone cooks with water mm -hmm. and in some ways, in some ways also it made me realize that actually everything happening locally there is, there's no magic to it. Um, it might have some better ingredients. So the fruit might be better and the meat might, might be better selected, but the water that they cook with is the same water that I could cook with actually in, in, in Germany as an entrepreneur to, to, uh, say, you know, speak figuratively. So in some ways it, it also normalized my expectation to myself of what I can do and what I can control. And then that no one's actually working on certain, some unfair advantage that you know, gives them a head start in comparison to what I can do. Um, so that was for sure, that was a, um, a pivotal moment. I think the other learning that I would actually quote is that in, we built a pretty massive sort of data and um, mm -hmm. data system. And what we always did, you know, in that data system was we were extremely frugal in the core and frugal, meaning we were conscious of very, very small choices on data we use, you know, resources we use, but also the operations that are necessary to operate the system. And, you know, that has a huge effect because you, you actually don't take shortcuts that then later become an issue when things scale, but you do that with a massive scale and scalability in mind. So like if you're, if you're out there actually building a software product, you know, yes, it's important to go out and actually expose it to your customers, like design mm -hmm. thinking. But more importantly, it's already like you can make very easy conscious choices to say no to certain things or yes to certain other things, but then already like have some flexibility, flexibility to either react to market changes or to let it uh, scale beyond actually sort of having to re re architect things over and over again. So that's a, that's more a technical thing or a product thing rather than actually sort of a entrepreneurial empowerment thing. But it, it's pretty, pretty key if once you understand that. You suddenly start to think differently about how to build products and solutions for certain current categories. Yes, yes, definitely. And uh, you mentioned that uh, you are an engineer by heart, and that's actually the fact that you can find uh, on LinkedIn profile of, of the people. And uh, those background, and we can say that it was your passion, it is your passion. Um, is it those inspiration uh, there is behind the founding of Farm? First of all, it was a random story. Um, so I think 
I, I, I was mentioning, so at the time I was actually working, um, to build like data businesses, um, in online advertising. So that meant that we were processing huge amounts of data about, you know, users behavior on mm -hmm. chain on, on, not on chain on the web. Um, and we were doing that for big companies such as WPP and, and Yahoo and eBay and, you know, massive companies. So we had a pretty, pretty big footprint of actually seeing what people are doing. And we did it because we were helping those customers to actually just increase the likelihood of a click of an advertising. So, you know, it was around about the time when sort of Cambridge Analytica had its scandal. And I was looking at sort of what people were doing with very small amounts of data. In this case, actually, sort of Cambridge had like, you know, used, I think it was 70 million user profiles on, on Facebook. And I was just looking at the stuff that we were doing. And I was like, uh, well, you know, I don't know whether this is the right category to spend mm -hmm. my life's work on. Right. And so it was a very conscious choice at the time to, to move away. And this was then the random moment where I, I moved next door to this crypto community house and I saw very interesting people go in and out of the house. I saw that basically I just had to take my coffee, walk next door, chat with the people and got exposed to this topic of blockchain and crypto that I've never been associated with. But, you know, obviously things come full circle. So with my background and actually having worked in the financial industry, then having worked in, 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 in software products, that okay. combination made me obviously appreciate some of the topics a little more than others might have. And I think overall speaking, um, you know, just having an open mind to interact with people that normally you would not be exposed to. I think all three things together, it's just then, you know, is there grounds to then discover something? So specifically to answer your question, the inspiration was then um, being exposed to the early innings in 2016 of that ecosystem. It became clear to me and my current co-founder, Timo, that the nature of the blockchain, instant settlement and single source of truth can solve huge issues in the financial markets. So from that moment on, we actually worked on how to bring that technology to um, to be used in financial markets. And at the beginning, we, we, we didn't have any exposure nor belief or conviction in cryptocurrency at all, um, because it was, you know, to us, this was just a technology that because of its nature could actually solve some of these issues. So that that was the genesis of it all. And we were naive enough to think that that could go quickly, but you know, it's, uh, it's one of those intramural inter inter stories. You have to work through it. Is it, is it. And if we could, um, took only one step back, what would you choose as the essential qualities or mindset that actually influence on your success when it was launching the business? I, I, th I think I learned a lot when I was working with, um, you know, Singularity University as an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. mentor, as well as with um, Stanford D School um, to help them with some of their design thinking programs. Um, because because what I discovered there was that, you know, you actually have to take yourself out of the equation. You actually have to, you have to, in, in learning about a problem and learning about how to solve for it, you actually have to spend an incredible amount of time, uh, you, know, you know, with the empathy of the problem. You have to start to put yourself into the, into the shoes of that, you know, potential user of whatever you're building. And you almost like, you should take yourself and your own pre-assumptions and your own assumptions, how that sol solution would look like, you have to take that out. And that requires you to be almost neutralizing yourself from, from it. it's a very, it's a challenging thing because it's almost like schizophrenic in a sense, right? But that then brings two qualities with it, which is number one, it, you have to be open-minded. So mm -hmm. basically just take what other people are telling you and actually be able to digest it and then, you know, play that back, but then be hugely creative and actually sort of trying to resolve, solve for it and be okay with being criticized. Again, you're taking yourself out of the equation only because you've come up with some solution doesn't mean it's right. So you have to have a way to actually sort of be, you know, capable to absorb criticism, to encompass whatever that means and then, then move on. Right. But, um, you know, the, the other parts of entrepreneurialism, I think beyond, but that, that's the core for me, the product side is the core, but the entrepreneurialism has more layers to it. And I think one of the most obvious ones is that you need resilience. You need a certain type of character mm -hmm. to, um, to, you know, push through it. You know, I wouldn't call it stubbornness, but it's perse perseverance. 
Um, and then just risk tolerance. Um, it's not for everyone to actually, you know, take daring um, decisions because entrepreneurism is about actually sort of making trade-offs. Mm -hmm. It's about actually bringing the trash out when it's needed. It's about, uh, you know, getting capital when it's needed. It's about actually hiring the right people or firing the right people when it's needed. So these decisions are often very lonely and very tough. But um, but when when you actually sort of put that together and you you don't just do that by yourself, but you do it in somewhat, you know, in an open fashion with, with the team, then it becomes extremely rewarding because you're actually sort of doing it with, with you know, co-pilots in that sense. Those qualities that you've mentioned, I believe that some of them can be gained through the different experiences which we have in our life. Uh, but there is such thing as entrepreneurial instinct. Do you believe yes. that you can be, you need to be born with those things or you can be taught? Uh, by, by the way, one preface, I think it's always glorified to be an entrepreneur. And it's not always the, it's not always the case, the harsh reality that it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a very, very tough category to be, to be working in. Right? So, you know, it's not right or wrong to be an entrepreneur or not an entrepreneur. There's, you know, certain qualities that someone has to have to be successful at doing a, a different type of activity than being an entrepreneur, being self-reliant, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, there are some days where I wish I was not an entrepreneur, that's for sure. Right. Um, but I, I think that, yeah, of course, you, you, you can learn it, um, but you, you, you sort of have to be like, it has to be because you're passionate about what you're doing, what the problem is you're, you're trying to solve. And then it drags you to actually so, you know, like to assume all the other qualities alongside with it. I don't think, I don't think that people are born or not born entrepreneurs. I think it's all based on the context from why they're entrepreneurs rather than, you know, sort of having certain qualities. I think there's certain thing that that can actually like make it more likely that you know that um, people become entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. For example, if they have been empowered by their parents early on, right, or by some teacher, or have found you know a fun in in actually sort of doing out and getting things done. I think that that can be extremely like beneficial for someone to discover entrepreneurism. But I don't think that there's anyone that is excluded from you know doing it. You've just mentioned uh, one thing, interesting thing, that uh, sometimes you have the time when the days when you don't want to be an entrepreneur. And uh, how do you stay motivated during such times? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a quality that you need for sure. I mean, I think what it starts with is obviously the surrounding environment, you know, to, to have support there. And, you know, my wife, my kids, they, they know me to be an entrepreneur. They know that I cannot always check my, my things that disturb me at the door. And, you know, they sort of live through the cycles of being an entrepreneur and indirectly with me. So if that environment was less tolerant to that, I think it would be really, really hard to be doing what I'm doing. Right. So, you know, Kudos mm -hmm. and shout out, shout out to everyone there, right? And and by the way, friends, friends are the same fashion, right? But like I was saying, it's um, it's often sort of very, very lonely in those decisions because you, you know, the complexity of what you're deciding, n no one else outside can really, really grasp. And I think uh, that's that's the reality, and you just have to be able to um, to do it. Um, I think if if I look back, that. You know, with with the consecutive successes in different projects, um, my confidence has grown that although maybe like sometimes it looks really dark and there's a lot of days where entrepreneurialism mm -hmm. looks dark, um, I've seen just in the past enough times where it's darkest before the dawn. And you basically, if you if you stick with it and are honest, whether it's a a path that is could be successful or not. In the end, it actually something works out, and um, and that's based on good work and 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 trying to stay you know on top of things, um, or even calling the shots and saying no, this is not the time to continue with this and actually stop stop doing it, right? So there's a lot of um, you know self motivation that you need to have in place, um, and it's not always easy, but you know I think that's a that's a personal quality that you have to have is that that stubbornness that you believe so much in something that you're actually willing mm -hmm. to take that onto yourself. 
Yes, yes, it's really important. Uh, Philip, I also wanted to touch on the topic regarding building highly trusted brands. So could you share with us on the strategies and approaches your company's world employs to cultivate trust? In a company, in a brand, in a solution mm -hmm. that is sort of built as an entrepreneur. And um, I'll touch on that first, but the second topic, or let, let's talk about the second topic first, specifically in the topic of Swarm, just maybe one sentence, we are basically a mix of a regulated um, platform, a banking institution that is now sort of pairing that up with decentralized technology. So by definition, we, we chose to do a different path than many other players in the crypto space where we said, you know, we in, in order to actually be ready for the next phase of the market, um, we actually need to go and, and become a trusted organization um, that is qualified by a financial market regulator and then is is cross-checked with decentralized technology so that you know we we cannot even be evil and if even if we had the choice to be evil right so um I think I think in this next phase of the blockchain based or the crypto based markets you know not only are regulators asking for this but you know it, it's essential that you know by design we design organizations and services that you know, broader parts of society can trust and they can all not not just trust because of technology but also because people have been looking at it from the regulatory side so that that said about that but to that first topic so one of the one of the most interesting moments as an entrepreneur I found was that okay you start off with an idea that is abstract you mm -hmm. sort of formalize that a little more you cross check it with customers at some point in time you say okay I want to build a company from this more people come in, customers come in, you, you mold that idea of, you know, continue molding it. You then actually develop a brand, you know, a name for a company, a name for a service, whatever it is. And then sort of in the progression of building that company, I found the most interesting and inspiring moments were the moments when suddenly a market or a customer or a, a broader, you know, set of stakeholders would talk mm -hmm. about that brand in almost a third person. And it had nothing to do with me at that point in time. So it became almost its own personality. And it's um, it's it's partly because, you know, it's evolved sufficient, but it's mm -hmm. also partly because suddenly the trust in the product and the service itself started being generated. It had nothing to do with me and my co-founders and my team actually representing that, which is the initial trust, right? So it's it's one of the most rewarding things that you can think of. It's almost like, like a child that you, you know, after school, mm -hmm. you, you you let go to college at that point in time, right? But it's 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 an incredible feeling at that point where you know you you notice that a market is talking positively about that thing, and that is something that you know you know hopefully services in a trustful way, but also just you know has a long life of its own. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you for your thoughts regarding this topic, and uh, also. I believe it last topic that I wanted to touch on regarding the innovation. Innovation, uh, they often involve taking calculated risk or, more, or maybe not calculated. Can you share um, an instance where you had to make a bold decision or bet on an unconventional approach? Yeah. Oh. Starting Swarm in 2016 or 17, mm -hmm. I think, uh, proposing to a market that was filled with libertarians and basically, you know, uh, people that thought that, you know, you know, society would have to be rethought to propose something where we said, okay, we're, bi we're building a financial bridge between the old financial markets and the, and the new financial markets. That was, that was a bold, you know, undertaking. It was bold from the sense that we knew that the, the audience that was existing back then was not amendable to this. You know, a lot of people laughed us out of the rooms when we were suggesting anything close to this. We, we said, you know, compliance and, and being sort of, you know, in par with the financial markets is a key design ele element here. So a lot of people from that side didn't understand it. A lot of people from the original side didn't understand it. But, you know, to us, it, to us, it was clear that at some point, these, these worlds at some point would converge. So, you know, we took a bet that it would converge. We didn't know exactly when. So, and you know, sometimes that takes longer, but then when it happens, it goes really fast. And we're seeing this right now in the market where, you know, maybe until, 
you know, 2021 possibly, there was a lot of leeway. There was a lot of questions that we had to ask ourselves whether actually sort of regulation would actually take place or not. But then suddenly since 2021, since all the scandals have happened, since a lot of work has happened already in trying to define what blockchain is, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of regulation has been put in place. Maybe a little, uh, you know, a much, uh, maybe too much regulation and too much, um, you know, um, measures on how to go about it. But, you know, that bet of designing that way, that was a daring bet. And, you know, it's obviously paid out over time, but we had a lot of identity crises along the way, asking ourselves whether it's a bet that was the correct bet. So you said uh, the swarm was launched uh, in 2016 or 17. Um, if you had the opportunity to come back to those time, if there is something that you would change? Um, I think there's a lot of things that ex post you can change, right? I mean, if you had the knowledge of what it is today um, or what the market has evolved in, you could do a lot of things very differently. It's almost like a lottery ticket. If you can, if you know which lottery ticket actually wins the lottery, you can go back and actually just choose that lottery, uh, you know, uh, token. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, you know, in navigating these uncertain times. So I, I think we've done a lot of things right. And whenever we hit, I and mean, this goes back to sort of these principles of actually building for flexibility and building for, you know, in a, in a frugal, nimble way, teams and technology that can adapt into different directions. Um, I think we were successful in navigating that, which makes me proud, mm -hmm. right? But of course, you know, in these uncertain times, we we had to make certain bets that, you know, were way more costly and time consuming than we than we thought they would be. Um, and of course, if if we had known things that we know today, we could have saved ourselves a lot of effort, time, and money. I believe that uh, the most um, enjoyable thing in entrepreneurship and in building the company, it's those uh, experience and those, let's say, right, which you are doing during building the company. And so if you won't experience a lot of things, so maybe you won't be as you are nowadays. Um, That's for sure. Yes. So thank you, Philippe, for your for your story, for sharing with us all of the insights and advice. I believe it was really inspiring uh, for our audience. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>